So thanks for having us. As Eric mentioned, um, I'm from the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. And I want to start out by just saying thank you because um, you guys do send us a tremendous amount of CSF referrals and autopsy referrals as well. And although I'm not very familiar with this area of the country, uh, we do know about Swedish. And that's primarily because the families come to us and talk about being diagnosed here. Um, so you definitely um, have some notoriety with the diagnoses. Um, and we travel with the CJD Foundation. They're a um, patient advocacy organization for patients affected by CJD. Um, they have some rapid referral sheets um, at the beginning where you walk in, and we'll talk about where they can be helpful. And then tonight, we're doing a family workshop for patients generally who have lost someone to the disease. So they can be a tremendous support, not just for the families, but also for the clinicians, which I'll talk about. So this isn't going forward or backwards. Sorry, is that uh, not working? It did buzz. Yeah, it's just the middle button. There you go. I just point it back there. OK. Uh, so what we'll talk about today is we'll talk a little bit about what prion disease is, um, how to diagnose it, and then how to manage it. So what is a prion? So prion is the pathogenic um, protein that causes prion disease. It's named um, because it's protonaceous and infectious. There is actually no DNA or RNA associated with the disease process. It's uh, just basically a transmissible protein. And it forms very tight amyloids, which make it very difficult to sterilize in typical uh, procedures. And we'll talk about that later as well. The way the prion, the, the prion paradigm works is we all have normal prion proteins. That's those yellow dots, the PRPC, which stands for cellular prion protein, uh, mainly expressed in our brain and in our gut. Um, but we all have them. They're normal. They're supposed to be there. They probably engage in neuronal housekeeping functions and second messenger uh, actions, um, as well as um, some uh, neuroprotective effects. And then for whatever reason, either uh, we get introduced to exogenous uh, disease-causing prion protein, or we have a post-translational protein modification. Uh, we come in contact with PRPSC, which stands for scrapie protein. That's the disease-causing form of the prion protein. It is um, biochemically the same type of prion protein as the normal prion protein. It's just uh, a different 3D conformation that makes it infectious. infectious. And it works as a template and converts normal prion protein into itself. And you get this autocatalytic cycle um, where you get more and more uh, fibrils, and then you get more and more. And that's the prion paradigm. We see this now also in uh, alpha-synuclein, uh, tauopathies, TDP43s, uh, A-beta. Um, there's a big difference between prion disease and those diseases, and that is that, that those diseases are transmissible uh, not only between individuals, but between species. Uh, as far as we know, um, none of those diseases are transmissible between uh, individuals and between species, only prion diseases. So I only really call prion diseases prion disease. The other ones you can say are prion-like or prionoid, but they truly aren't prion diseases. Uh, the most common cause of prion disease by far is sporadic. It makes up about 85% of all cases, um, about 10 to 15% closer to 10% in our country are genetic forms of the disease. And they're named according to what mutation is, causes the disease and also what the neuropathology and the clinical characteristics look like. So they can be called genetic CJD, fatal familial insomnia, or gershman strauss schenker syndrome. And then the ones that you hear the most about are by far the least common, and that's the acquired forms of the disease. That includes things like Kuru, iatrogenic, and variant CJD. And we'll talk about each of those in detail later. So most people know CJD as a younger onset dementia, and that's because the mean age of onset, especially for sporadic CJD, is about 62. But if you look at the different etiologies of prion disease, you can uh, break them up in age categories. So variant CJD, which is CJD due to eating meat contaminated with mad cow disease, um, tends to be a very young onset form of prion disease. So patients typically get ill in their teens and 20s. 
Genetic CJD tends to be a disease of midlife, so you see people in their 40s and 50s. And then sporadic CJD tends to be a mid to late life illness, again, with the mean age of onset of about 62, but with a lot of variability. So in our country, we've seen sporadic cases as young as 14 and as young as 98. Um, so again, these are just generalities, but there's a lot of variation in them. And of course, people know prion disease for rapidly progressive dementia. So the mean age from onset to death, or the mean duration from onset to death is four to six months. Um, about 20% of people will live longer than a year. So you do see longer duration cases of CJD, um, but they're not super common. Most people die uh, well within one year. So epidemiology, most people have heard the one in a million number, which I think is a little misleading. It is an epi statistic for incidence, which means it's one new case per million individuals per year. Um, truth be told, the harder you look, the closer you get to two per million per year. Um, but that's across the whole population. And as we just demonstrated in the age slide, not everyone gets prion disease. It tends to be a mid to late life illness. So perhaps a better way of looking at how common prion disease is, is how many deaths are due to prion disease in the US every year. If you look at that statistic, it's about one in every 7,000 deaths in the US are due to prion disease. So again, we're not saying this is a common disease, but that probably is not as rare as you maybe thought that it was. So take, for example, you go to a football game. Uh, depending on what stadium you go to, you have about 20,000 people at that football game, right? You're gonna have about two or three people that are at that stadium that will develop CJD at some point during their lifetime. So that one in 7,000 is actually a lifetime risk. Um, so again, it's not common, uh, it's not, not super rare either. Uh, so I apologize, I'm from uh, Baltimore, Maryland where words like Washington, water, and wash have an extra R in them. Um, so I don't mean to uh, disparage your state, but if you take Washington as an example, you have about seven and a half million people. Um, so you would expect eight to 16 new cases every year. Again, about 20% of people will live longer than a year. So that's an extra two to three cases. So it wouldn't be unusual and actually would be expected to have about 10 to 19 active cases in Washington at any one time. Um, I think most of them come here because my understanding is you're the biggest um, hospital system in the area. Is that correct? So, and with your academics, or we could just make that up. That's fine. <laughs> I, we can say that. Um, but also you have the academic bend as well. So probably the majority of patients, not just in Washington, but also in neighboring states that don't have uh, a lot of neurologic expertise will come here. And I think that explains why you see so many. And of course, we talked about last night at dinner that once you recognize a case and have diagnosed the case, because it's actually uh, in your mind, you're much more likely to consider it uh, for further diagnoses and make the diagnosis again. So the only way to definitively diagnose the disease is actually neuropathologic examination. And we do that in two ways. We do H&E staining, uh, where you see these large vacuoles, um, which actually gave rise to the original name for prion disease, which was a spongiform encephalopathy, because the, the holes look like uh, sponges. And then we can take um, antibody against the abnormal prion protein, do immunohistochemistry, and you see those brown deposits, which show deposition of the prion protein. So there's two ways you can do this, of course. You can do it at autopsy, but you could also do it by brain biopsy. Um, we strongly recommend against brain biopsy for a variety of reasons. One is uh, usually you don't really need to do that to make the diagnoses. We'll go about, we'll review some of the more recent uh, diagnostic tools that we have that are much better than in years past. Uh, but also, you really don't wanna biopsy a suspected case because it really doesn't add anything. The only thing it adds is trauma to the patient, um, probably extended stay in the hospital, and also possible exposure to OR staff. So really, in, in our opinion, the only reason to do a biopsy, if you don't think it's CJD, uh, and you have a biopsyable lesion that you need that tissue, either for, for diagnosis or for treatment guidance. So we have a couple different criteria for diagnosing uh, probable CJD now. We'll review the old criteria, and then we're gonna review new criteria that actually came out about three months ago. So the old criteria is you really needed to recognize the syndrome of CJD, right? And that syndrome usually includes dementia and two or more of the following symptoms, including myoclonus, uh, cerebellar or visual symptoms, which often look like uh, gait ataxia or dysmetria. Visual symptoms can look like visual spatial difficulties, uh, sometimes, 
uh, cortical blindness, uh, pyramidal, extrapyramidal symptoms, and then at the very end of the stage, we get uh, akinetic mutism, which is lack of volitional uh, speech or movement, which arguably is not that helpful for diagnosis because pretty much any end-stage cortical dementia will get that, and it's at the end of the disease stage, so it uh, doesn't really help your diagnostic process. So you recognize the clinical syndrome of CJD, and then you have a couple diagnostic tests that you can use. So you can use um, uh, EEG, and you look for periodic sharp wave complexes. Uh, you can use the 1433 protein in the CSF and a shorter duration disease. And you can use brain MRI, which I think has really, really helped the field a lot. And we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about the criteria. So from about 2009 till last year, this is how most probable cases were diagnosed. And there's a couple problems with this. Number one is you actually have to wait for the clinical syndrome to manifest, which in an outpatient setting, that's not going to happen, right? Um, oftentimes, the patient's at least two-thirds of the way through the disease before you see all these symptoms. So you have a late diagnosis. Uh, but recently, with the advent of a new test called RT-QUIC, uh, which is very specific to prion disease, we're now able to make a probable diagnosis with any neuropsychiatric symptom in the setting of a positive RT-QUIC. Uh, so that's completely different than I think any other neurodegenerative illness at this point, uh, and extremely powerful. And we'll talk about why it's so specific. So what's important to remember is not everyone will present with that classic CJD phenotype. And in fact, if you look at all the cases that present, really only about 13% of cases will present within the first couple of weeks with classic dementia, myoclonus, and ataxia. Most patients will present with a cognitive syndrome, looks like an atypical dementia initially. So a lot of times these people go to a behavioral neurology clinic or a geriatrician or a geriatric psychiatrist and they're maybe misdiagnosed as MCI or Alzheimer's disease, um, about 17% are very interesting because they just present with a fairly subacute onset visual syndrome. And a lot of times, uh, they'll have a, a fairly sudden onset of that visual syndrome. They'll get an MRI and they'll see the, the um, cortical ribboning, and sometimes people will be diagnosed as having a stroke. So they're very commonly misdiagnosed as stroke. And then there's a certain phenotype that present with mainly uh, cerebellar ataxia for the first month or two, and that they'll develop other symptoms still later. That's called the oppenheimer brunel variant. Um, but you know, most people don't present with that classic CJD phenotype. So this is an example of an EEG of a patient with CJD. You see the classic periodic sharp wave complexes. Um, I personally don't really use EEG to diagnose CJD that much anymore because it's not really that helpful. It's very helpful for ruling out mimics, you know, like status. Um, but you don't really see periodic sharp wave complexes that frequently in CJD. Um, you only see it in certain molecular subtypes, and you only see it during a portion of the disease. So it only usually occurs about two-thirds of the way through the disease. So if you do an EEG, if you're not doing it at the right time in the right CJD patient, you're never going to see it. Um, it is, I think, helpful because when you do see it, it is fairly specific for CJD, so it's helpful in that regard. But again, most of your CJD patients, when you do your spot EEGs, you're not going to see a periodic sharp wave complex unless you kind of get lucky. Uh, MRI, I think, is very different. So we use diffusion weighted imaging, and we see uh, either one of two findings or a combination of the two, and that is um, hyperintensity in the caudate and putamen or in cortical ribbon. Most patients will have both. Some will have either one or the other. Uh, but usually 95% of sporadic cases will have one of these findings, and actually quite early. So we have a case series we're putting together right now of about 10 patients that happen to have MRIs done for what we think are completely unrelated symptoms um, from CJD that actually had positive MRIs before their clinical symptoms evolved. So it seems like it's a very early um, finding in the disease. And I like to give a, an example of a patient that we saw in Baltimore who presented to us. Um, so usually we review all the records and all that before we see the patient for whatever reason we didn't for him. And his chief complaint was um, he does yoga every morning and he usually can do a headstand for about five minutes. He can now only do headstands for two minutes at a time. Um, I think we talked about at dinner the high prevalence of conversion disorder diagnoses in this population. So obviously, you know, that would be high on your radar with an individual like this. 
Um, he had a completely normal neurologic exam. His MOCA was 27 out of 30, which is normal. This is actually his brain MRI. Um, so what had happened was uh, he was in a bike race. He fell, hit his head, prompted the neurologist to get an MRI, and this is what they found, and they freaked out. Um, truth be told, the gentleman died two months later of autopsy-confirmed CJD. So one could argue he had no symptoms at all of CJD, although you know that may have been why he fell off the bike, certainly why he probably couldn't do his headstands for longer than two minutes every morning. But you certainly wouldn't have ever suspected that gentleman to have CJD based off his clinical symptoms at all. So we see this time and time again, especially in behavioral neurology clinics, where someone presents for a dementia evaluation, there are no other symptoms, so there's no real clinical suspicion for CJD, but their MRI pops up looking like this, and sometimes that's the first time where CJD is actually even considered. So moving on to CSF testing, um, we do three CSF tests at the center. Two of them are just markers of neuronal injury, and that includes 1433, uh, which we'll report as positive, negative, or ambiguous. I would argue that any result is ambiguous with 1433. Uh, and then tau. So tau is a little bit more helpful because you can quantify it, so you get a number. And in general, the higher the number, the more likely it is to be prion disease. The problem with these two tests is they're not very specific. They're going to be positive in anything with rapid neuronal injury. So they'll be positive with seizures, head trauma, transverse myelitis, MS, 14 through 3, sometimes if the patient sneezes while they have the LP. Um, literally, pretty much anything can give you a positive result. So they're not very specific. Again, tau is a little bit more helpful because if you have a very high number, that can be helpful to guide you. So they give you an example. A normal tau would be 200 to 300. Alzheimer's or FTD, you might get 300 to 400. Usually in CJD, it's in the thousands. Um, but you can see that also with seizures. However, uh, we now do have that very specific a uh, disease-specific test, RT-QUIC, which actually detects the abnormal prion protein itself, um, and that's why it's so specific. So the way RT-QUIC works is it stands for real-time quaking-induced conversion. The QUIC does not stand for it being a quick test. Uh, it takes 60 hours to do. Um, but they used quaking because basically that's a fancy word for saying shaking. And they didn't want to use S in this acronym for obvious reasons. So they came up with RT quick. And the way it works is we really take advantage of the prion paradigm. We take a 96 well plate and we put recombinant normal prion protein in it. That's the substrate. And then we add the sample. In our case, it's almost always CSF. Presumably, that sample will have the abnormal prion protein, PRPSC. And then we add thioflavin T, which binds to fibrils. And uh, for lack of a better term, we put it in a shake and bake oven for about 60 hours. And that kinetic energy, the shaking, the stopping, the shaking, the stopping, and the temperature really causes that uh, autocatalytic cycle of more and more prion protein being produced, and you get thioflavin T, which binds to the fibrils that are caused, what we call seeding, and then you get real-time phosphorescence um, that tells you it's a positive result. So theoretically, you would never expect a positive RT quick in any other disease that didn't have abnormal prion protein. However, there is no such thing as a perfect diagnostic test, right? There's always lab error. There's always person error. So there is no such thing as a 100% specific test. So if you look across the countries um, and you compare things like 14 through 3 to RT quick, you'll find that of course, RT quick is much more specific, you know, usually 99 to 100% in most data sets, but also it's quite sensitive as well. Um, so we recently looked over the last three years of samples that we received. So we received close to 11,000 CSF samples over the last three years at the center. And uh, if you look at all comers, um, sensitivity is about 90%, specificity is 99%. We've had one. Uh, false positive went to autopsy. That was a multifactorial dementia, Alzheimer's, and vascular. Um, it was an atypical curve, um, so it wasn't your you know clear positive RT quick curve that we normally see. If you look at sporadic cases, um, the sensitivity is much better. So that sensitivity is usually about uh, 94, 95 percent. The um, sensitivity drops in atypical. 
sporadic subtypes, things like sporadic fatal insomnia and the uh, wonderful uh, termed disease variable proteosensitive preanopathy, which I love trying to say. Um, these are very atypical. You know, they make up about you know, 2% of all cases of CJD. And it's also diminished by genetic forms of the disease. So as we'll talk about later, things like fatal familial insomnia and gershman strassler schenker syndrome um, have much less specificity for rt -quick. So I do like to point out that 1433 is done at two centers in the US. It's done at the Surveillance Center and at Mayo. So I do like to try to point out um, some differences. Uh, 1433 is done differently. We do Western blot, they do ELISA. Um, at Mayo, and I think these are the more important considerations, is they'll only do the test that you order, right? So if you order 1433, you'll get 1433. But if you forget to order a tau, you're not gonna get tau, right? So you have to remember to order it separately. Um, with us, you don't even need to know what you're ordering. You just say, we think this is a prion disease, please test the specimen, and we'll automatically do 1433 tau and RT-quick. So that's, I think, helpful. Um, also, we're the only lab in the country that will do RT-quick because of the, the prion precautions that you need to take in the laboratory setting. Um, and also, uh, if you have a positive result, we'll automatically follow up with you about our free autopsy program. So we're funded by CDC to help with CJD surveillance in this country. And one of the ways we do that is we coordinate autopsies uh, around the country. And that's very important from a surveillance standpoint. It also can be helpful for the family's perspective because they get closure. They also know where the disease came from, whether or not it's genetic or not, whether or not it's variant CJD or not. And I think as a clinician, it's very helpful to know what your patients have, right? I mean, autopsies, I think, really probably should be done more just for our educational, um, you know, um, educational goals, because especially in the fields of like dementia, uh, I mean, it's, it, a lot of times it's a guessing game. So it's really helpful to have that feedback and to know uh, what your patient actually had. And I think do, families do appreciate having closure as well. So a common question that we get is, I have a patient, they're 1433 positive, their tau is in the low thousands, but their RT-quick is negative. You know, what do we do? Uh, and our suggestion usually is re-examine the diagnosis. So the first rule of diagnosing prion disease is actually not diagnosing prion disease, right? You wanna make sure that you rule everything else out because there are a lot of treatable mimics of the illness like perineoplastic encephalopathies. Uh, so you really want to make sure that uh, you've really truly ruled out other forms of rapidly progressive dementia. Um, you know, these are the patients that get the million dollar workup. You know, by chance alone, sometimes people will have a positive finding. Just make sure you follow up on the positive finding. Make sure it's not clinically relevant for your patient. Are there any other tests that could be suggestive of prion disease? So do you see periodic sharp waves on the EEG? Are there MRIs positive? And then um, if the answer is no to that. Uh, is there a possibility of an atypical prion disease? So could you potentially have a genetic form of the disease? Do you have an autosomal dominant pattern in the family? Uh, does it look like an atypical sporadic or fatal insomnia? Um, and then of course, uh, does it look like variant CJD? So these are you know, extremely rare circumstances down here, but a lot of times these will be the circumstances that will result in a negative RT quick, a negative MRI, and a negative EEG. So moving on to genetic prion disease, again, 10 to 15% of all cases, uh, due to uh, all mutations of the prion protein gene itself, there are about 40 different mutations. Uh, most are point mutations, but you can get some insertions and deletions. Um, they're, they can cause different clinical phenotypes, neuropathologic phenotypes, that's why they're named differently. It's important to remember, and we talked about this at dinner last night, that not all genetic mutations of the prion protein have equal penetrance. So it used to be thought until fairly recently that almost all mutations of the prion protein gene have pretty close to 100% penetrance. We now know that's not true. Most do have very high penetrance, but there are some that don't. So for example, E200K is the most common cause of genetic CJD. It does have high penetrance, um, but it's not, a hundred percent. So it's, it's also age related. So uh, most people don't start getting ill until about the age of 65, but there's a huge variability. Things like uh, FFI and GSS have much higher penetrance, but then you have things like V210I, 
uh, V180i, which have penetrances, sorry about that, of about 10% or 1%. So this is important to know. Uh, so for example, if you get an autopsy result back and it says that it's genetic CJD, you really do have to look at the mutation and see what the penetrance is. And if you have any questions, you can always call the center. We'll be happy to update you with the most up-to-date penetrance for that mutation because it's always changing. And that's really helpful information for the family, and it really does help guide whether or not they want to get asymptomatic genetic testing. Um, but that's certainly something we can help you with. Uh, so clinical features of specific genetic prion diseases, as you would expect, genetic CJD closely resembles sporadic CJD. So you get that classic CJD phenotype of dementia, myoclonus, and ataxia. The durations are quick, so four to six months. Um, and also a lot of the typical diagnostic tests that we use for sporadic disease are positive in genetic CJD. Fatal familial insomnia, as the name implies, typically presents with insomnia. Uh, Neuropathologically, FFI is characterized by extreme thalamic loss. Uh, so they're basically losing their hardware for autonomic functions, so they lose the ability to sleep. But they also get a lot of autonomic uh, uh, dysautonomia, so they'll get spontaneous parexia, um, they'll get bradycardia, they'll get tachycardia. Um, and then usually in the beginning, they'll present with a psychiatric syndrome that looks a lot like PTSD. But they usually don't develop typical prion disease symptoms until late in the disease course, so dementia, myoclonus. A lot of times you won't see that until the last month of life. Uh, and it also tends to be a rather longer duration illness, so one to two years. <clears throat> Most of the diagnostic tests that we have for CJD are negative in FFI. Um, in our last series of RT-QUICs, none of the FFI patients were positive for RT-QUIC. Um, there are other countries that do occasionally have a positive RT quick, but for whatever reason, and the families in our country, we're not getting that. Um, occasionally, you'll get a positive MR, MRI, but it's very um, rare. And because of the longer duration disease, it's not uncommon to have a negative 1433 or a low tau. Um, so if you have a case of FFI, how the, how the heck do you diagnose it? Um, recognize the clinical phenotype. You can do a polysomnogram. Um, and you see loss of uh, slow wave sleep and REM activity. Uh, personally, I think the easiest way to capture it is to do FTG PET. You'll see pretty extreme uh, hypometabolism of the thalami um, and relative sparing of the cortex. Uh, gershman strauchler schenker syndrome, or GSS, so we don't have to keep saying that, is a very atypical prion disease. Uh, one would argue it doesn't look like a prion disease at all, and that's because it tends to be long duration, so mean duration is about five years, but we've seen cases up to 20 years. Uh, and it tends to present with a very isolated cerebellar or Parkinson's plus syndrome that doesn't really evolve to classic prion disease symptoms till late in the disease course. And unfortunately, like FFI, a lot of times the diagnostic tests that we typically use are negative. Um, RT quicks positive in about half of cases, and about 30% of cases you'll have a positive MRI. Um, TAL and 1433 are almost always negative because of the long duration. So these are hard, I think, um, diagnoses to make because they're really not on your radar as potential prion disease. So one question that we often get is after a family gets uh, an autopsy report that their loved one had genetic prion disease, is why would they consider getting asymptomatic testing? And I think nowadays it's completely different than what it was 10 years ago. There's a lot of different reasons. So of course some people just want to know um, because they need to know or they want to do family planning. Um, or financial planning. Uh, of course, you can participate in research. I think, and this is true for a lot of neurodegenerative illnesses, it's the people that we know that are going to become ill later on that are probably going to be the ones that are going to be most likely to benefit from potential treatment trials. So uh, we certainly see this with FTD and progranulin mutations. I think we're going to see this in CJD um, where the therapeutics are probably going to be much more helpful in people that aren't ill yet, but we know what we're targeting and who we're targeting. So a lot of people want to know so they can participate in these types of studies. Um, but also, uh, there's this new thing called um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis with in vitro fertilization, um, which is kind of science fiction, but not science fiction anymore, where basically you can do IVF and they only implant the embryos that don't have the mutation. 
so you can have biological children and know that they don't have the mutation. So it basically ends the disease uh, after that affected individual. Um, so a lot of people in our community has ch have chosen to do this. I don't know how um, your community with HD and ALS have done this, but certainly in the prion disease community, it um, has pretty rapid ac acceptance and also uh, national coverage has been a couple of New York Times articles written about it. There's a New York Times um, author who wrote a book about a GSS family called Mercies in Disguise that was basically about this process. That's an interesting book for your book club if you're interested in reading anything medical. Um, but really, it has kind of changed a lot about how we do genetic counseling. Uh, so moving on to acquired prion diseases, uh, Kuru, iatrogenic, and variant CJD. Uh, so everyone is eaten, I'm assuming we're good, okay. So Kuru, um, most people I think know the story, but for those of you who don't, is really how we first discovered how prion disease um, transmits. So basically there was this rapidly progressive dementia cerebellar syndrome in the 1940s, 1950s, in this 4A tribe of Papua New Guinea. It attracted a lot of international attention because it was only affecting women and young children. So everyone thought it was this weird, uh, somehow unusual genetic inheritance pattern that no one has ever discovered before. So people from all over the world came and studied this disease. And it wasn't until the anthropologists got involved that they started discovering that these people, as part of their uh, death rituals, would consume the body of their loved ones out of respect. So they engaged in ritual, ritualistic cannibalism. Um, and then the thought was, well, maybe we need to look at that as a transmission. So what's interesting is only the women and young children partook in the mortuary feasts. So that described the transmission pattern. So probably what happened is uh, one person in their tribe developed sporadic CJD, and other members of the tribe consumed their loved ones and kept transmitting the disease. So when uh, Australia colonized Papua New Guinea, they outlawed cannibalism, which was very helpful because we have a time when we know that cannibalism existed and a time where it didn't. So then we're able to calculate things like incubation period. And what we've learned, and we see this in other prion diseases, that in Kuru, the incubation period can be up to 52 years from the time that they were exposed to their cannibalistic episode to the time that they became ill. So really this is you know, where we discovered that prion disease can be acquired and can have these outrageously long um, incubation periods. And before we knew that it was due to the prion protein, these used to be called slow viral illnesses because of that fact. So of course you can do this in the medical setting as well with iatrogenic CJD. Um, before we really understood the risks of reusing cadaveric material, uh, you would see this much more commonly. So in the US, most cases of iatrogenic CJD occurred to uh, cadaver-derived human growth hormone that was, it only, take, it only takes one in 7,000 cadavers to have a contaminated um, batch and they mix all, mix all the batches of human growth hormone. So what happened was they only had one case, probably more than that, but it contaminated all the batches, and then it was injected into children with short stature, and then they developed CJD later in life. So we're still seeing cases of iatrogenic CJD, even though that process stopped about 1977. So we had a case last year, at the end of last year, of iatrogenic CJD with an incubation period of about 42 years from human growth hormone. So thankfully, we use recombinant human growth hormone now, so we don't do this. Um, we also can get iatrogenic CJD from using uh, cadaveric um, dura matter, which actually still is used occasionally, but rarely. We usually use synthetic dura matter, uh, and then also things like corneal transplants. Um, neurosurgical instruments, but it's important to point out that for neurosurgical instruments, we've only had four documented cases, and they all, all occurred in the last century. So that's important to know because although you do need to take special precautions to remove infectivity completely from neurosurgical instrumentation, it does suggest that at least typical sterilization is removing a lot of infectivity or else we'd be seeing more cases. Um, you'll see at the very bottom, um, blood transfusion. So this is a very specific use case scenario, and that's variant CJD or CJD. 
uh, due to mad cow disease. Uh, there's no epidemiologic evidence that sporadic or genetic CJD is transmitted this way, although it is theoretical, but there is epidemiologic evidence that variant CJD is transmitted this way. And that's largely probably because it's an acquired peripheral disease, and it also resides in lymphoreticular tissues, so spleen, appendices, malt tissue, and the gut. And that's probably why you have blood infectivity and variant and not other forms. Uh, so to date, we've had only 231 cases of variant CJD, although probably millions of people were exposed. The mad cow epidemic occurred primarily in the UK, so most of those cases happened in the UK, followed by other European countries. You'll see the US has had uh, four cases of variant CJD, all of which were thought to have been acquired overseas, two in the UK, one from Saudi Arabia, and one the person traveled so extensively it's really difficult to say exactly where they acquired it, but if you look at incubation period, it almost certainly wasn't the US. Uh, we haven't seen a case of variant CJD um, for the last three years uh, in the world, and in the US, our last case was 2015. Variant CJD is also an atypical prion disease. It occurs in very young people, so teens, 20s, 30s. has a longer duration, usually over a year. And they present with uh, psychiatric symptoms, so usually a mood disorder or apathy. Uh, and a lot of times these patients were initially diagnosed as a psychiatric condition. They were admitted. Psychiatric hospitals give an ECT, so it's pretty traumatic for the families that are involved in this. Um, they do have a positive MRI finding, but it's different from the MRI finding that we see with sporadic CJD. So in sporadic CJD, we typically look at DWI, and we see basal ganglia or cortical ribboning. In variant CJD, we see hyperintensity of the pulvinar nucleus on flare. Uh, it's called the pulvinar sign. Sometimes people call it the hockey stick sign. Uh, it's very specific for variant CJD. You can see it in sporadic cases, but you almost always see it in conjunction with basal ganglia or cortical hyperintensity as well. Uh, rt quick is universally negative in variant CJD, as well as 1433 and EEG. So really the only diagnostic test we have is MRI and clinical suspicion. So the mad cow epidemic occurred in the 1980s. Um, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not it could be transmitted to humans. There is another animal disease called scrapie of sheep and goat that, for whatever reason, is not transmissible to humans. So there was a lot of back and forth, and the government uh, at that time in the UK decided to say that it probably wasn't transmitted to humans, so they didn't take any precautions. Uh, and then in 1994, we started seeing very young cases of CJD in the UK uh, through neuropathologic examination, which is key. They're able to link that prion protein to the BSE prion protein uh, and establish causality. Uh, and then in 1996, they presented this to the government, uh, and they started instituting feed bans. So what's interesting is actually mad cow disease is not a naturally transmitted disease amongst cattle. It actually was man-made induced. It was kind of a man-made Kuru epidemic because we were refeeding cattle to each other. So once we stopped refeeding cattle to each other, the epidemic stopped. So now there's specific regulations in the UK and in the US and other countries where you can't include certain materials in the food supply, not just to humans, but to other mammals as well um, because of this risk. So that feed ban started in 1996. So the, the peak uh, incidence in at least the UK was about 2,000, so that's an estimated incubation period of about 10 to 15 years for variant CJD, although like with Kuru, like with iatrogenic CJD, we're going to continue to see this very, very long tail of cases probably from that initial exposure. But I think it's probably safe to say that the majority of cases have already presented. <clears throat> so the question is, though, Millions of people were probably exposed to mad cow disease, and to date we've only had 231 cases. So what about other people that are exposed? Are they silently incubating the disease? So the UK sought to answer that question. And again, variant CJD is unique in that it resides in lymphoreticular tissues. So they're able to answer this question by doing a survey of appendices collected in the UK. So they looked at over 30,000 appendices, and they found that 16 cases were actually positive for prions in their appendices. And these were cases that had not developed variant CJD. So that um, there was no difference by birth cohort, which is a little um, 
questionable because that means people born after the BSE epidemic were also represented in this sample. Um, doesn't matter their genetic makeup, all seem to be affected. Uh, so that's an estimated prevalence about one in every 2,000 Brits are silently incubating um, variant CJD. So if you've ever given blood, you know, you have to go through the questionnaire. One of the questions is, how much time have you spent in the UK and other European countries? And this is why, because if you spent a certain amount of time in the UK or other European countries, uh, the US has chosen to defer uh, your contribution to the blood supply uh, for the potential that you could be silently incubating the disease and put the blood supply at risk. Luckily, we don't have a lot of mad cow disease in our country, but we do have a pretty prevalent uh, animal prion disease of deer, elk, moose, and caribou called chronic wasting disease, which you may have uh, heard referred to as zombie deer disease. Uh, I don't know why the media has to make up these names, but uh, it is helpful, though, when you uh, petition Congress for money. They use these kind of terms, but otherwise, it, it really serves no purpose but just to scare people. And they don't look like zombies. Uh, they waste chronic wasting disease. Um, really, it started out uh, in domesticated deer uh, in the 1970s in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, and then once it got out of there, it's kind of spread uh, year by year. Uh, so this is where chronic wasting disease is now in the US and in Canada. Uh, pretty much every month, a new county is added. It's a kind of disturbing prion disease. It's by far the most easily transmissible prion disease amongst its own species. So again, in cattle, it's not transmitted between uh, you know, cows unless you refeed cattle to each other, but in deer, it's transmissible by uh, urine, saliva, and feces. And they're free-ranging animals, so you can't call them either. And then you have incubation periods, so you don't know who's silently infected and who's not. And then they excrete, you know, saliva, urine, feces into the environment, and then other animals come behind and graze in those fields. So it really is kind of a disaster in the making. Um, luckily, we don't have any evidence that CWD is transmissible to humans right now, but that's obviously something that's very important to continue to monitor. It's what we do at the Surveillance Center. It's why we really encourage people to get autopsies on patients if you can, because the only way we're gonna answer that question is by looking at neuropath tissue. We also don't know what CWD would look like in a human. So there are some um, macaque studies that suggest it may look more like a motor neuron disease than a rapidly progressive dementia. So uh, there's a lot of question marks and unknowns, uh, especially not just for the deer supply, which could you know, easily wipe out the deer supply if we don't do something about it, but also we don't know what the impl implications are for humans and other animals. Um, in the last couple of years, cases have popped up in Norway and the, most recently in Finland. Uh, and the thought was that hunters use urine to attract deer and that a hunter in Norway imported U.S. deer urine that was contaminated and that was enough to cause an endemic in that country. Uh, so you know, they have a huge reindeer population that's very wild. So they basically caught a large amount of wild reindeer and the hope that it would uh, tamp down their epidemic. So we're gonna briefly talk about experimental treatments. Uh, unfortunately, this is a quick topic because we haven't found any helpful treatments. People have looked at quinacrine, doxycycline, pentosin, polysulfate. Uh, these are all supposedly working by inhibiting the conversion of the normal prion protein into the pathologic prion protein. None of them have shown efficacy, unfortunately. So moving on to prion disease care and management, uh, I like to break it into different phases. Diagnosis phase is probably the ones that you guys are most familiar with. These are the people that come into the hospital for the million dollar workup. Um, you know, it's a million dollar workup, million dollar uh, or million send out tests. So make sure you discuss the process with the family, let them know kind of what's going on, what you ordered, you know, where it was sent, the fact that it's gonna take a while to come back. Uh, don't forget about present needs. I mean, literally, these patients will change day to day. Uh, they may not have any, you know, disturbing myoclonus one day, and the next day, you know, you have to treat them pretty aggressively for their myoclonus. Refer to organizations and clinicians familiar with the illness. So that includes the CJD Foundation, which can be really helpful in holding the family's hand, because a lot of times we don't have time to do that. But they're very helpful with that. And they also have a lot of information that's written for family members, which is 
hard to come by with, with this disease, and that can also be helpful. I think take some of the pressure off of the doctors that feel like they need to do that. Um, uh, obviously, you guys are the clinicians familiar with the disease, so just keep them in house, and you'll be good apparently. Um, and discharge planning. So I operate under the philosophy that once a diagnosis of prion disease has been made, you really should discuss hospice because um, hospice can be most helpful in the beginning stages of the disease. And if you can get them set up with hospice before they leave, that's ideal because as soon as they go home, they're going to rapidly deteriorate. The family's not going to be able to orchestrate that from home. It's just going to be a disaster. So as much as you can, arrange discharge planning before uh, please try. And it's really important, especially in today's medicine, to establish a key worker, because you send out all these tests, including tests to the surveillance center, that take a while to come back. And a lot of times, patients are discharged from the hospital before everything comes back. And unless there's someone who knows to follow up on all the results, sometimes they get you know, lost. So a lot of times, we'll hear that patients won't get the diagnosis of CJD until after the patient's passed, because a resident had ordered um, the RT quick. It came back in their inbox, but they're on a different rotation, so the result never got back to the family. So caring phase, once the diagnosis has been made, frequently reassess, uh, patients change very rapidly. Uh, they're also very sensitive to sensory stimuli, so ironically, these are probably not the patients that you want to put next to the nursing station. So we have one patient whose myoclonus was so bad that when the nurse would come into the room and turn on the light, uh, they would start and fall out of bed. Um, so just keep that in mind, too, when you do rounds, because everyone wants to see prion disease patients, and we encourage that. But it might be better to do in short, uh, you know, um, small groups than to bring in the whole team all at once. Uh, assess caregiver requirements is an extremely burdensome disease for caregivers, and the patient's only going to do as well as the caregiver does. It's another, I think, perk of the foundation is are excellent with giving caregivers support. Again, we talked about hospice and respite care. Symptomatic treatment, it's all supportive. It's your basic geriatric, you know, neuropsychiatry management. Um, you know, try not to use medications if you don't need to. A lot of symptoms can be behaviorally managed. If you have to use medication, start low, go slow. Be careful what you pick. Um, for example, for psychosis, if you have to use a neuroleptic, um, you know, use a low-potency neuroleptic like uh, a quetiapine or clozapine. And typically, you only need it for a week anyway, and then they'll kind of progress out of needing it because they tend to be very sensitive to extrapyramidal symptoms. And then uh, reevaluate frequently. Again, you could start it at the beginning of the week, and they could not need it later on. So afterwards... Uh, again, we strongly encourage you to try uh, to get an autopsy and at least discuss it with the family. Um, if they're interested, you know, the sooner you're able to help us know that so that we can coordinate, the easier it will be for them and also for us. Um, frequently check in with the families afterwards. We were talking at dinner last night that probably the most frequent question I get usually about two days after the funeral from the family member is that we were caring for our loved one and we understand this is a transmissible disease. Are we at risk of acquiring the disease? And you know, it just, I think, says a lot about the, the burdensomeness of the disease that they never think to answer that question during caring for their loved one, but they almost always ask it afterwards. So it is helpful to kind of anticipate some of those questions and check in with them. Um, if a postmortem is performed, please make sure that someone is communicating the results. Um, if you can do it in person, that's great, but we know that's not always possible. If you have any questions about the postmortem results, um, we'll be more than happy to go over them with you. Um, I admit our autopsy reports are very uh, difficult to read, and we are changing them to make them not just easier for um, the physicians to read, but also for the family members to read as well should you give them a copy. Uh, and of course, encourage contact as needed. Uh, so I'll just end with infection precautions. Uh, for routine clinical care, standard precautions only. You probably have uh, more risk of developing or acquiring pneumonia from these patients in CJD. Um, there's no need for gowns, masks, isolation. Um, remember that, so a lot of times we say that to the family members and then a healthcare team will come in in moon suits afterwards. The family's like, what gives? He told us, we're fine, we're here in our street clothes, you're here, uh, you know, getting ready to blast off. Um, so just remember that. 
this is different though when you deal with high infectivity tissues. A high infectivity tissue is brain tissue. So in the OR, in um, autopsy suite, you do have to take special precautions. Um, they're very well demarcated in several guidelines and easily able to be found. Um, those are the instances where you do need to do the extra sterilization, extra autoclaving, um, sodium hydroxide. But for routine clinical care, um, you don't need to do anything. Uh, there was a very large international study that looked at the incidence of CJD in healthcare professionals, and reassuringly, there was no increased risk in any healthcare professional uh, compared to the normal population. Um, I see many prion disease patients. Uh, I have a family. I would never put my family at risk if I thought that, um, you know, they're, I was going to be contaminated with CJD. Uh, so hopefully that serves as some cells. So in summary, uh, diagnosing CJD can be difficult and frustrating, although I think in the last few years it's actually become much more easier and hopefully you feel like you have better tools to help with your diagnosis, especially with the confidence of your diagnosis. So what we've seen is uh, clinicians really like that positive RT quick because it gives them a much uh, firmer confidence in conveying that diagnosis to a family member. Um, getting a proper diagnosis and managing a patient with CJD can be stressful, but it's very doable and I think extremely rewarding as well. Uh, and care and management of patients with prion disease is mainly supportive and does entail some several disease-specific interventions that we discussed. So um, if you get anything away from this talk, just know that in the U.S. we do have a lot of resources for patients and families affected by prion disease and for clinicians that are working up a patient for suspected prion disease. Um, we're more than happy to help you uh, talk through any patient that you have. Uh, we do CSF testing, we do blood testing for asymptomatic or symptomatic genetic diagnoses, brain biopsies, although we discourage it in patients with suspected CJD. And of course, we'll have a free coordinated autopsy for cases. Um, we also have a free brain MRI consultation program. So if you want us to take a look at your MRI, we'd be happy to, and we do that free of charge. Um, CJD Foundation is an excellent resource for clinicians, but especially for family members. Again, everything you've written in lay language. Uh, believe it or not, we do have uh, support groups. So we have a New York City support group that meets, is it twice a month or once a month? once a month, and people show up to that. So again, it can't be that rare if you have a local support group. And then we do once or twice a month uh, teleconference support groups, which usually have 50 to 70 people on them at one time. Um, so that can be helpful because then you know, patients and their families know they're not alone. And of course, we do these workshops when, when we travel uh, to try to make people feel included. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, you can always contact me directly. So thank you so much, again, for all the referrals that you guys send us, but also for the excellent care that you give the patients and, and for inviting us to speak to you.